Hello, my name is Morn Ettenberg. I'm president of Princeton Infrared Technologies, and today I'm going to talk to you about shortwave infrared imaging and our shortwave infrared imaging products. So our shortwave infrared, infrared imagers are based on indium gallium arsenide detector arrays. Uh, our premier product is right here. It's our 1280 by 1024, what we call MV camera. It's an uncooled uh, 1.3 megapixel in-gas camera, 12 micron pitch, 14-bit output, does over 90 frames a second. Uh, camera link, as I said, output. Um, we uh, supply, it goes visible 400 nanometers all the way up to 1700 nanometers. All of our products is what we call substrate remove. We remove the indium phosphide substrate so you can see visible as well as shortwave infrared response. We also have uh, our side camera shown here. This is the cooled version of that camera, still 1.3 megapixels, does 90 frames a second, or cools the imager to minus 60 degrees C. This allows us to do very long integration times, over three minutes long on a single integration time. Uh, very low noise on both cameras, less than uh, 50 electrons. Uh, this cool version also does camera link output as well. Um, we also sell linear arrays and line scan cameras. So linear arrays, here this is the linear arrays packaged, and then these are linear arrays unpackaged uh, if you want to embed into your system. These are 1024 by one on 12 and a half micron pitch. They also do visible through shortwave infrared, one of the only linear arrays in the world. Um, they're backside illuminated, uh, no wire bonds to the linear arrays. They also have a wide dynamic range, 14-bit output from the chip, and they go from 100,000 electrons all the way up to 100 million, depending on your application. We also are able to put these uh, linear arrays into our line scan camera, which we sell. This is a line scan camera has USB output as well as camera link, still 14-bit, and this actually runs the linear array, makes it very easy for you to integrate. Uh, we supply software with it as well, camera link and USB 3. And speaking about our software, so now we have our 1280 by 1024 running, and now we have a running on showing our software. So this is imagery from the 1280 by 1024. We're looking at um, uh, a scene right now, I'll close the aperture a little bit. Uh, scene right now where we have some water and glasses. We have a soldering iron turned on, as well as a um, blue plastic bottle where you can see the fill level. Now let's take a look what it actually looks like in the visible so you have a better idea. So here's our soldering iron. Uh, it's on, I won't touch it because it's hot. Uh, we have water in these glasses, and then we have liquid in this, um, in this plastic bottle, which is very hard to see the spill level in the visible. Um, and it's also hard to see that the soldering iron is on. But in the shortwave infrared, these things are readily apparent. Now, our camera is seen in the visible and shortwave infrared at the moment, so the water is not as apparent because it looks clear because we're getting a lot of visible light. But I take this silicon wafer, silicon as we know, uh, tr absorbs anything below 1100 nanometers, but when we, uh, anything above 1100 nanometers, it'll transmit through. And so we're able to see through the silicon wafer as shown here. And when we do that, we start to see only shortwave infrared light. So now the water goes dark, as we can see in this picture. Let me focus a little bit better. And you can see the fill level very easily in the plastic bottle. And of course the soldering iron is on, and now as the soldering iron on and you can see it, it's actually illuminating the scene. And we're so, um, we can actually see thermal imagery through glass and plastic. And we can actually see through this glass piece. We can actually see the thermal light coming through glass. And you can't do that with a thermal camera. Also, you can see it through the water as well as the plastic. And so we can see thermal imagery. And also acts as a light source, as you can see, as the scene gets brighter, because we're actually illuminating the scene with the soldering iron as the source. And these are shortwave infrared products that we make at Princeton Infrared Technologies. Uh, so Princeton Infrared Technologies is a fabulous semiconductor company. Um, we use a fabulous model, very similar to the silicon industry, uh, not very much used in the infrared industry. And so we have other fabs that manufacture our in-gas to our specifications. This uh, 
allows us to run uh, wafers at a lower cost than other fabs because we don't have the overhead of the fab. And we get to leverage other people's processing uh, to get better uh, statistical results uh, on our wafers based on just the, um, the volume of other wafers going through the fab. Um, this is something was not possible with Census Unlimited or Xenix 20 years ago, but now is possible today. And we're one of the few infrared imaging companies that are using this model today, uh, very similar to what's being done in the silicon industry. So shortwave infrared technology. So we know that there's long wave out at eight to 12, there's mid wave from three to five, and then short wave is basically where visible ends um, at 750 nanometers, some people consider it out to uh, 1,000 nanometers, uh, that's where silicon ends, uh, all the way out to about 2.6 microns, and that's where there's a water absorption band in the atmosphere, and also where glass cuts off. So there are several materials we can use. There's indium gallium arsenide and its alloys. Uh, the most common indium gallium arsenide at 5347 is lattice matched indium phosphide, and that gives you this curve here, which is 0.9 to 1.7. The 0.9 cut on is due to the indium phosphide substrate, and the cut off is due to that lattice constant of ingas that we use that matches the indium phosphide. We shift the lattice constant to go to longer uh, wavelength material, we're no longer lattice matched indium phosphide, and that causes huge amounts of dark current in our material. So you can to make ingas that goes all the way up to 2.6, but it has a lot more dark current and it's generally not used. People usually use uh, mercury, titanium, telluride, or indium and timonide because they've had uh, lower dark current and more in production. But in gas, that wavelength range is starting to become more and more common. And we're now also starting to see uh, multi-quantum well and string layer super lattice material that runs in, uh, that goes out to that wavelength range. Um, as I said, Mercat, Telluride, and Innsby are both available. They require a significant amount of cooling, and they're a lot more expensive material for imaging in this range. Uh, the other material we're starting to see is colloidal quantum dots. Uh, they're coming onto the scene now. They can allow for smaller pitch. Uh, their advantage is they're very low cost. Their disadvantage is they have uh, very low quantum efficiency. As you see here, quantum efficiency of being gas is somewhere in the 80-85% region. Uh, colloidal quantum dots are somewhere around the 5 to 10% region, maybe 15 at best. And they also have about 10 times uh, to uh, 50 times more dark current. So they're noisier, they collect less photons, so their overall signal to noise ratio is significantly less. But they're a lot cheaper. So in-gas focal plane arrays made like lots of other infrared imaging arrays. We have our silicon multiplexer down on the bottom. Uh, we attach each pixel by indium bump deposition, and then we place our detector material, the in-gas detector, which is on an indium phosphide substrate, uh, on top. And it's upside down, the light comes in through the back. Uh, in our case, all of our products at Princeton uh, Prince Infrared Technologies, uh, originally at Senses Unlimited, but at Princeton Infrared Technologies, is substrate removed. Um, and so there's no substrate there, which allows uh, imaging out to 400 nanometers uh, due to the thin indium phosphide. Uh, cathode that's left in place. Uh, military applications, we can see all the major lasers on the battlefield. Uh, this is a 106 laser designator. Not only do we see the spot, but we can see it reflecting off dust particles in the air. We can pick up hot objects like rocket plumes, uh, rocket engines, jet engines, various other objects. Uh, camouflage is not very effective in the shortwave infrared either because you're trying to camouflage visible light, but when you start to look in shortwave, most camouflages aren't made to camouflage shortwave infrared, so they become highly reflective. Uh, better atmospheric penetration. Uh, this is a 12 megapixel camera here uh, versus a 1.3 megapixel shortwave infrared camera here. You can't even make out the thousand meter buoy. Uh, these are, this is Lake Carnegie, so we actually know exactly how far the buoys are because this is a rowing lake. So we know the uh, exact distance of the buoys. Uh, that's the 500 meter and the 1,000 meter buoy. And it is just lost. And it's due to the atmospheric haze. And we're only talking about a small amount of atmospheric haze. This is a pretty clear day, as you can see. There aren't that many clouds uh, uh, seen here. Uh, cloud absorption is very strong in the shortwave infrared. Water is black, very absorbing, and water in the atmosphere uh, absorbing. But the atmospheric haze Due to the size of the wavelength of light we're using to get better penetration. Uh, better night visibility. 
So there's something what's called night glow. This is hydrogen and oxygen combining in the upper atmosphere. Uh, when there's a full moon out, as one knows, there's plenty of light in the visible, as well as the near infrared. But when that moon goes away, that light goes away and you can't see anymore, which is why on a moonless night it's hard to see. Don't know why it just advanced. Uh, but in the shortwave infrared, you can see there's still this light out there in the shortwave infrared band. And this is due to this hydrogen oxygen combining in the upper atmosphere, otherwise known as night glow, which allows us to see at night. This is a intensified CCD, which is a night vision tube attached to a silicon CCD camera. And this is a sphere imager. And you can see the fidelity of signal and noise difference is huge. Uh, this is actually me, uh, about 60 miles outside Las Vegas in the desert. Uh, this was an airplane that just happened to be flying by. We can see very far away. And that on the ground is not a flashlight. That's a cigarette that the person threw on the ground. And you can see how bright the cigarette is because it's emitting heat. And that is uh, very visible in our wavelength band. Uh, better imaging through fog. This is down in Florida, Orlando, Florida. We're looking about three miles away at a hotel uh, in the visible and then shortwave infrared. Uh, this is San Francisco, uh, across the harbor, two miles away. You can't even see the, the city, but you can see in the shortwave infrared. Uh, smoke penetration. Uh, there's a forest fire out in the northwest. Uh, there's a lot of smoke, but we're able to see the car uh, in the shortwave infrared, uh, but in the visible, it's kind of lost. This is me again. Uh, this is a shortwave infrared image, and we're using the soldering iron to actually light up my face. The lights are off in the room. And you can see my hair goes white, uh, skin color goes dark. We're looking at water absorption in the skin. Uh, the coloring of my shirt goes away because we're only looking at shortwave infrared. The striping pattern is made for that. But when we turn on the lights, um, you can actually see the striping pattern. My hair goes dark again because now visible light dominates. As I said earlier, our cameras are all visible response. So we see from 400 to 1700 nanometers. Uh, in this case, we're using a poor lens. This is a visible lens at the time. So to focus in the visible on me, the shortwave infrared from the siren iron becomes um, unfocused. While in here, when we're just using shortwave infrared, I don't need to use the visible portion, so everything is in focus. Just interesting. Uh, lensing matters a lot with these cameras. Um, chemicals are different. These are all clear liquids in the visible, but when you look in the shortwave infrared, they were actually supposed to get darker in color as one move through, but in reality, the isopropyl was darker, and it took me a couple days to find out why. It ends up that our technician lets the isopropanol out for two days, and actually collected water from the atmosphere. And we're actually looking at water absorption in the isopropanol, which is why it's darker than the acetone. If you would have been a fresh bottle, it would have been just increasing darkness. But because the, uh, the isopropanol was left out, it absorbed water in the air. So. As I said, water absorption is pretty big. Uh, you can also see the anodization on our camera. Uh, the anodized metal is highly reflective as opposed to um, black and the visible. Uh, water and oil don't mix, and we actually show where it happens right here. This is water and oil on a piece of metal. Uh, they look quite similar in the visible, hard to tell them apart, but in the shortwave infrared, very obvious. The water is very absorbing, the oil is not. We're able to see the water oil line. Uh, contamination, this is a processing where you're looking at coffee beans versus wood and rocks. All this is kind of similar in color, very hard for a visible imager to tell apart. But the shortwave infrared with 1400 nanometer filtering, the coffee beans stand out bright while the wood and the rocks are not. And so we're able to sort the wood and the rocks from the coffee beans and that way you're not grinding up rocks in your coffee. Uh, this is our SICAM. A uh, cooled version of our camera, as I said, goes from 400 to 1700 nanometers. Uh, it's 1280 by 1024, 45 electrons of noise, 14-bit uh, ADD. Um, it can be cooled to minus 60 degrees C, give over three minutes of integration time. Um, we also have this in an uncooled version. This is our MV camera. Same features on the camera, but you can't do as long integration time because the imager is not cooled anymore. Uh, but built for machine vision applications, could do about 100 frames a second at full 1280 by 1024. We also have our line scan imagers, uh, 1024 by one. Um, we have two versions, 250 micron tall pixels for spectroscopy, square pixels for when you do machine vision, does 30,000 lines a second. 
uh, various full wells, 14 bit output, we can go from 75,000 electrons all the way up to 100 million. And then we also saw the linear arrays, if you want to embed it in a system, this is the linear array itself. Uh, basically, in conclusion, um, we build in-gas cameras. These are all ITAR free, so they can be shipped around the world. Um, uh, obviously, there's some restrictions um, on export. Uh, they're not ITAR restricted, but um, you can't sell them into North Korea, obviously. Um, we're interested in selling FPAs as well as imagers and cameras, and we're willing to work with you. You know, if you have an application you want to take a look at and you want to see what it looks like in Swear, we're happy to take a look at samples, and we're always working with our customers. So, thank you very much, and good day.